So here we are. We're going to talk about improving your product analytics practices and tech stack today. You've got myself, um, I'm Scott, the CEO and founder of Terum, and Chris, CEO and founder of Vero. Hello. Let's uh let's get going. So yeah, I'm Scott, CEO and founder of Terum. We're a product development firm. We're on the AFR Fast 100, two years running, all about delivering products for clients. I've been involved in a whole bunch of product launches and also love sailing and making sausages or barbecuing like brisket, that kind of thing. That's my, my little personal note. Um, got Chris with us. Chris is the CEO and founder of Vero. So fun fact, I met Chris for the first time in a cave in the Blue Mountains, an unusual place to meet fellow um, tech person. But hey, that's where you meet people. And um, yeah, look, Vero is just an outstanding success story. They're sending over 250 emails per month. That was in March. Huge amount of interactions. I think what's, what's interesting for us to be really lucky to chat to Chris is he's like in there um, using analytics to drive the development of his product, but also very close to the marketing and product stacks of all of his clients as well. So we're getting like two perspectives there, which I think um, is pretty lucky. And I, he's telling me he's just taken up tennis, which I feel like is the, the most lucky kind of sport to have taken up. It's like the only sport that you can play at the moment, I think. Pretty lucky there, Chris. Yeah, yeah. They've had it closed for a few weeks, actually, but they're, they're opening back up today. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely on the lucky, lucky side the of course. that equation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, just stay, stay that 1.5 metres away. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's get into it. What are product analytics? Um, I'm going to, just to set the scene, I'm going to go through setting a scene on how we think about product analytics at Terum and with our clients and what we see as some of the best practice. And then I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk through what they've done at Vero and what he's seeing in the market and also how, how their stacks evolved and how they use it to build their product. So what are product analytics? Let's set the scene. It's, it's capturing and analyzing quantitative data for how users interact. And I think that's the key. It's their behavior that, that you're measuring. Why do analytics matter? Um, I'm sure the people on the call are already convinced of the value of analytics, but in case you've got to convince someone else, there's a fantastic McKinsey um, research paper that basically says those that extensively use analytics really, really outperform um, their competitors. And here's a, here's a great chart that, that shows the results of their survey. Um, and before we get into how, like the details of the nuts and bolts of product analytics, what I want to share is just how, how you want to come to thinking about product analytics. And this, this, this is sort of these product led principles and the approach really come from Google. I can't take, take the claim. And what they say is, Product-led approach is all about an outside-in view. So what do, you, what do your customers want? What do those outside want? And analytics is a great way to objectively um, capture that. What are your customers doing? How are they behaving? A rapid approach to early validation um, with analytics, to me, that means getting something in, getting something measured. And then the next point of the principles is maturing it through iteration. So, you know, start measuring something and then evolve it. It's all about evolving. You're not going to get your analytics right the first time, but it's not the point. You want to evolve it quickly as you learn more um, and evolve your product off, off analytics. And then the last point is one that I, that, that I personally add to this because I see it getting missed all the time is super disciplined prioritization. And to me, analytics are like the fundamental linchpin of disciplined prioritization. So you, know, you, you can't make decisions without data and analytics is where you're gonna get your data from. So before you start on your, your analytics journey, there's four key things that you, you wanna have a bit of clarity on. And that is, what is it your customer needs to achieve with your product or, or service? Number two, what's the business objective, which sometimes can be at odds with the customer need. What's the business objective that you wanna achieve? You know, is it, is it revenue, is it market share? Is it um, 
if your government or, or, or a similar kind of service, is there some kind of more intangible uh, measure that you're trying to hit? You know, in the, the times of, of coronavirus, it could be around health, something around health that you're trying to hit um, or balance. And then where are you in the product life cycle? Because that's going to impact the kind of metrics you want to pay attention to and the parts of the, frame, the metrics frameworks that you want to pay attention to. And finally, how are you going to determine success or failure? And this, this one's huge and often, often gets missed, uh, or at least one part of it gets missed is, you know, if you're putting a product out there, what are the analytics that you want to see coming back or the metrics that you want to see coming back that determine whether that feature you launched or product you launched was a success? And then um, similarly, what means it didn't work? You know, what means it didn't get the take up that you were hoping for? That's equally as important. And so really get that clear before you get started on your journey, because these four inputs are going to change what you want to measure, how you want to measure it and why. And I'm always a big fan. On, yeah, on you go. Go. On that last one, do you mean just determining ahead of time what, what the metric for success or failure looks like you know, for something you're building? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I've been bitten by this myself. Um, continuing with a feature that, let's be honest, like wasn't a success purely yeah. because you're seeing little increments of progress. You know, maybe you're seeing like 10% extra usage. You're like, oh, if we just make this one more little tweak to the feature, more people will like it. Yeah. But, um, you know, really, if you had a thought objectively at the outset and said, you know, how's this feature going to succeed? Well, it's like, it only succeeds if we get 50% uptake in our user base, either for commercial reasons or because, you know, only at that point does it mean you've really solved a problem, then you probably would have killed the feature off and put your energy elsewhere. So I think um, the, the failure metric or the failure, the line in the sand is equally as important as, hey, this is a standout success. Because to be honest, like success is easy because we all know it when we see it. <laughs> it's middle outcomes and poor outcomes that are a bit more difficult. So I think failure is equally as important to put a line in the sand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cool. So yeah, then, so what do you measure? Look, I'm a huge fan of don't overthink some too many things. And I want to give you a really, if you just walk away with one like little thing from this, it would be if, you, if you're having trouble getting started or you're a bit lost in, it might not even be getting started. It might just be you've got all this data and you, it's not really useful to you. Uh, over time, I've come to find, find the job to be done that's most, most relevant to you. Pick that and figure out how you're going to measure it. You know, what analytics can you put in to measure that? Think about the activation of that, your features that enable that job and what analytics you need to measure that activation and then measure performance. You know, is, is, your, is your app responding in a meaningful um, time frame? Yeah, is it taking 10 seconds to respond or two seconds to respond? And if all you measure is, is that, then you're already well on your way. I, I just see a lot, of, um, a lot of teams, I guess, getting too caught up in too many metrics because it's so easy to have data available to us now as well. So, so narrow your problem down. And just some quick tips is, uh, like I was just saying, don't try to measure everything. And next one is um, measure leading, not lagging indicators. So. Uh, revenue is a lagging indicator and also monthly active users is a lagging indicator. Um, look at what leads to someone being a monthly active user and start there. Only once you got that right should you move on to a measure of monthly active user or, some, or revenue for the product. So now we've got some of the basics and getting started so you don't get too overwhelmed. Now let's get into the frameworks in more detail. So. Uh, this is the my personal favorite framework. I, I love it. I, I wouldn't really use anything else. And it's Pirate Metrics. So Pirate Metrics comes from if you put the first letter of each of these these um, these things together: acquisition, activation, retention, referral. Then you end up with R, which is where Pirate Metrics come from. It, it's actually quite a, a serious framework, <laughs> despite the name, and it comes from. Um, a, a really well-known startup investor who came up with this framework to understand all the businesses and products he was he was across and and how to measure them and compare them. And so, uh, the points are acquisition. You know how do customers find you? How are you measuring that? Activation. That's how quickly. I just view it as how quickly 
can you get your customer to complete their job to be done? And that's really their aha moment where they go, oh, I can use this to do what I need to do and it works and I like it. And then the next one is how do you get them coming back for attention? How do you get them doing that again and again? Then how do you get them referring it to others, whether it's other customers or, or for B2B products, it might be how do you get them referring it within the organization? And lastly, there's revenue. How does all this link through to, to increasing revenue? That's the Pirate Metrics framework. You can read a lot more about it online, but this gives you a little overview to get started. Then what you can start doing, I, I found there's layers to that. So for instance, if you're looking at a B2B product, then and you're either getting started or trying to make sense of your data or getting started with a new feature you actually need to start um you need to start in one of these two places either users only measuring your users or only measuring accounts and you might say well you know uh i don't want to do that i need to measure all of them well my experience has been if you try and measure all of them at the outset you're just opening yourself up to a lot of unnecessary effort and going back to the principles of product, when you haven't validated enough around the way you're measuring something or the feature that you're measuring and whether you've got that right, to start building in all these linkages and data transformations and everything to be able to link users and accounts together, um, it, it's kind of overkill. So pick, you know, for this feature, we're just going to measure it on a user basis or maybe we're going to measure, measure it on an account basis. And when I say an account, I mean, um, you know, if Terum signed up to a product, then you would maybe view us as an account. Or separately, you might say, well, if if one if the marketing team at Terum signed up, they'd be one account. And then if uh, uh, someone on our delivery team signed up, they'd be another account. And if someone on our product team signed up, they'd be a different account. I don't know, but accounts are just different different groups that have signed up and added users to is is the way I think about it. So yeah, just. Just think about starting with users only or, or account only. And then from there, progress into loosely linked accounts where you might link them on some features, but not others where it's easy. And if you're really getting serious, you might want to link everything up properly. But again, don't go for that straight away. It might seem like the thing to do, but it's actually a challenging, can be a challenging task to do across all of your analytics. So, uh, and then lastly, you then want to add in different parts to your model and how you're measuring doing your analytics, which is, do you then think about, you know, I mentioned the example before of different teams within Terum signing up as different accounts. Well, how do you then link those together as one account? And it might seem simple on the surface, but it's actually hard, especially if they've signed up independently, if they're paying from different budgets and different credit cards. Uh, how do you do that? And it's it's not an easy problem to solve. The, the next one is then, you know, do you have different, do you track users by different roles? So, you know, is an admin user in your analytics coming through differently to um, a team member who might be coming through differently to uh, a different type of user, like a mid-level admin? I, I don't know, it's something to think about with your product and how important it is. And also specifically, how important is it to the feature and the problem you're trying to solve at the time. And lastly, you know, whether you want some industry stats across it. I was gonna say, Scott, you know, we've certainly found that it tends to be pretty clear depending on what you're building, uh, I think, as to which one of those you should be looking at. So, you know, you know our, our products are essentially a messaging platform just for context for everyone else. And so, you know, one of the features we're um, you know, about to release is a, a drag and drop campaign builder. And you know, that feature in terms of thinking about your success metric stuff before, I mean, that's, that's very much designed with non-technical users within the accounts that use our company, use our product, sorry, within yeah. those companies. It's the non-technical users we're targeting. And so if the primary product analytics that we'll be looking at is, well, you know, what's the uptake within that role, that within cohort? That role. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then also, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're more interested in like, do those individuals start using this feature at the moment? Uh, it's a first order thing than if the account as a whole does, you know, whereas conversely, I don't know, maybe if we rejigged our onboarding flow or the, uh, let's say we rejigged the team, team management feature, maybe we'd be much more interested in, you know, this loosely linked account or the account level stuff. Yeah. 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 And especially where you're trying to get it up and running, right. You want to be focused on those exact users. And then maybe once you get it right, you can just back off to an account level yep. and just measure it in, you know, X percent of accounts are using it or, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, 
add some good color to, to that. And uh, so the next thing um, we're then going to go into is, well, all right, you've got some frameworks to think about how you're going to measure what you're going to measure. And so the next one is, how do you put it into practice? Because it's analytics doesn't work well if you just do a one-off project that's, oh, great, you know, we, we studied our analytics and now we're going to do go and do X from learning from it. Analytics is something you really want to embed into the team. And the best way to do that, you know, a lot of teams are familiar with Agile, so we'll just stick with that. The best way is to embed it into your rituals. You know, you might create some other rituals specific to analytics, but make it a part of your everyday work. And this will result in some things that I've seen that have just been amazing, where, you know, engineers that previously weren't so interested in usage of the product, all of a sudden are asking every morning, you know, that feature they released, they're like, did it get 20%, you know, did, did I get the 20% conversion rate target up? Did I, did I manage to improve that last step of the journey? Are we still getting the 50% drop off? Did I manage to change that? I've got some ideas about how I could change it. Getting them focused on analytics comes from embedding it in, in your rituals. And it's super exciting to see that happen because you get more ideas come to the fore. So those practices, um, those rituals, so backlog grooming, you know, just be thinking about it when you're grooming your items as to uh, whether you need to be including more work for your analytics to get some platform stuff ready. Uh, be asking yourself, are these features ready to go? Have they got the analytics components specced out? Um, then you want to be thinking in your daily standup, you should be bringing those metrics up every day because ideally you're set up with real-time analytics. It'd be crazy not to. Um, and then uh, you should be looking at it every day. And, and there's a good question to come up like, do you need to wait? My thing is if you're needing to wait for your, um, your analytics to come through, it depends on the product, but a lot of products, you should be able to see change on an almost daily basis. Um, it, you know, if you've got enough volume going through, you should be able to see a case of, all right, well, we released this feature and only so many people took it up. But you're right, like it might take two weeks to understand whether you got enough data to evaluate a feature. But you still, should still be having, having that data come through on a daily basis. Um, so you should be able to look at it, look at your dashboards in the morning, show it to the team. If there's no change, you can discount it, but you might see some interesting things. And you might even change tack partway through a sprint. So... Yeah, then in your retro, you want to be looking at the insights you got, how quickly you're getting those insights. You know, is, is uh, every two weeks good enough or should you be getting it every day? And, it, and this one really comes down to features as well. Some features or jobs to be done that you're trying to solve will take longer. Others, you should be able to see the impact immediately, um, as in overnight within kind of 24, 48 hours. Um, and then the last one, when you're reviewing your sprint, make sure you're looking at the items in your sprint and looking at the like the acceptance criteria, if you want to get right down into the nuts and bolts, it must have analytics. You know, you, you must be checking that your analytics are working and that you've embedded analytics for those features. If a feature is live and you've got no no way of someone knowing if someone's using it through your your analytics platform, then it's kind of like you know, does anyone hear the tree fall in the forest if they're not around? How do you know if your, your product's succeeding or failing if you can't measure it. Um, so then hopefully that, that uh, Nilan, hopefully that answered your, your question. Just let me know if it didn't and I can, I can cover it off a bit more. Um, so then the next one is putting things into practice with, uh, with Scrum. So the roles that you need, and these roles are not necessarily like, I don't want anyone to run out and suddenly employ a product analytics leader, data engineer, database admin, product analyst, data scientist, put them all as individuals on the team. The point that I really want to make with this slide is what you want is someone wearing these hats. So you want someone wearing the hat of product analytics lead, probably your product manager, who's really the champion of using analytics on the team and, and driving uptake, driving people to check it, driving people to remember to implement it, implement it well and think about how it's used. Then you want your, your data engineer. It's probably one of your engineers who's really responsible for making sure that your analytics are flowing technically through the system into your, into your database. 
and uh, you want a database admin. I, and I say that because often these analytics problems come down to some pretty um, technical database wizardry, which even a great engineer may not know. It might be about indexing things well, might be about certain being able to do joins in a particular way. It might be like I've been tripped up personally by permission settings because I just don't have that that deep level of SQL needed to wrestle with um, with permissions in SQL. And then you want your product analyst, someone who can take the data from the point of view of the customer, the business, and understand and make sense of what's going on. And in some cases, but not all, and I, I think I see too many people jumping to wanting a data scientist, where often it's kind of like way, way, way down the track and probably not needed ever in many people's cases. But you may, depending on the nature of the product, you may think about having a data scientist on the, on the team, especially if you're dealing with very large volumes of, of uh, user data, um, like many large companies are. But uh, just to finish off on that, don't go there until you've exhausted all your other options. D yeah, jump to the data scientist after like two years of trying with the other options would be my, my quick two cents. Um, so now we've kind of, just before I skip, any questions on the roles and embedding analytics in your rituals and in your team? I mean, I, I don't. My, I suppose, in terms of when you're doing this, Scott, and you have your sprint catch-ups, is there a standard yeah. set of metrics you're bringing to each one that you're kind of looking through uh, as an overview? Uh, yeah, or, it's a... or are you just focus? You know, obviously, whenever you're having a sprint, there's a sort of there's generally a project that's on the go. You know, do you just focus on that and the metrics related to that? Yeah, but, we tend to focus on that. To be honest, look, we'll we will. There's a bit of <laughs> vanity or or nervousness that goes into checking the um. You know, like the your, your your high level metrics are like active users. You know, the big ones. But yeah, we'll we will um really focus on the project underway, or the, you know, like the feature we launched last week, and we'll be checking that probably a bit too much and saying, you yeah. know, did we have the impact we wanted? Those are the ones that we really try and bring in. The the ones that are underway or that we're about to work on, in like the feature that we're about to pick up, we'll just check the analytics again. Yeah. To see if anything's changed with it. Yeah. So keep it pretty focused, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, otherwise, it's too overwhelming. I think. Yeah. I um, agree. So yeah, let's get into the types of tooling. So there's your. This goes in. What do you need in your stack? Um, so your essentials, which is your event-driven analytics and/or your your own product database. Um, there's plenty of products: mixed panel, amplitude you know, on the database side, like Postgres, whatever you, you, you and your team are using, that's kind of the essential piece. Next one is some plumbing to move your data between your tools. A segment is a great example of that, sending data from your product off to your analytics, your other analytics tools. You got your, this one's your, your journey research. So um, the, your journey research is, really around we, we use this for different problems and we use different tools and turn them on and off so for instance it might be as i've shown hot jar there we might be trying to debug um what users are doing at a specific point in time because we're having a problem getting them through a funnel and so we'll use hot jar to see where they're moving their mouse around to try and see if we're not leading the user to the right spot or if they're getting stuck and there's plenty of other tools you can use for really specific use cases to kind of debug them, I suppose. I think of that as journey research, where you're trying to research and understand much more detail around a specific journey rather than see across your, your product. Um, the next one is, uh, so platform or domain specific tools. And there's like, you know, really specific analytics and, and metrics for, um, shopping carts, mobile apps, um, cloud, SaaS products. There's, there's just, you know, you, you can even get things that just focus on like cart abandonment. There's lots of really specific tools that you'll pick for your specific domain, um, product, platform, whatever, and industry. Then there's your performance tools. 
they're often associated with DevOps or the, the tech team. And it's things like how quickly is your database responding? How quickly is your, your, your app responding? Are there errors coming through? And then lastly, um, custom reporting. So once you've got a lot of the other pieces in, you know, you can run to, you can go to running SQL, um, uh, really just SQL queries or, or other kinds of queries on your data. Often the harder one to implement. So um, there's a couple of questions there. I might come to them a, a bit later um, in the in the Q and A. So the uh, so the stack behind. I just want to give an example. Here's an example stack of the actual products used behind a software as a service product that has enterprise and small to medium um, users. And so basically segment is pumping data from the, what the users are doing in the application, whether it's via Slack, via UI, via a web service, it's all getting pumped out to mix panel amplitude. We, we were using both for different, actually had benefits in different use cases. Um, and then that's also getting pumped out to a data warehouse, uh, which was just Postgres SQL. And we're also using AWS Lambda to pump things out to HubSpot and then using Mode to do analysis. And we're also using Hotjar when we were having problems in a user journey to debug what we, where people were getting stuck. And we're using um, Intercom as well, as well as AppQs to try and debug parts of a, of a user journey. So just that, that's a real stack. I'm now actually gonna hand over to, to Chris to give even more color to, uh, like a live example. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and hand over to Chris. And so, so the questions that we've got again, we'll just come back to um, in Q and A. Chris, you should be um, yep. over to you. No problem. Cool, hopefully everyone can see that and I'll just hit present. All good, Scott? Yeah, all good. Yeah, cool. Um, well, it's not what I wanted. Yeah. So for a bit more context, as I said before, you know, we're a, uh, we're a SaaS product ourselves. Uh, so we have a web app and we help other online businesses message their customers. Uh, so that's sending both their campaign driven messages, you know, product updates, marketing promotions, et cetera, uh, as well as our real sweet spot is what I would call product engagement messaging. So emails and push notifications to try and get customers to engage uh, with their digital product. Uh, so we both, yeah, as Scott said, you know, we, we obviously uh, try and um, practice a bunch of the stuff that Scott was preaching there internally to build our own product. But at the end of the day, our product is also consuming uh, this sort of analytics data uh, that our customers produce because they're using our tool as part of their product life cycle. You know, so they're looking into what their customers are doing. If they're, if they're not taking some specific action, they might want to send a whole bunch of messages to try and engage that customer. So I'm definitely familiar with what our customers are doing as well to try and solve these problems and how we fit into that stack. Um, so hopefully I can give some perspective on, on both those things. You know, this is our architecture, which looks not dissimilar to the slide Scott just uh, had. So yeah, really, I think a few things I'll talk about here, but to explain what's going on first, you know, we, we think there's at least two main types of data we're interested in looking at for our product analytics. One is obviously the data generated by the web application itself. So our actual product, obviously if you create a message in there, we save that message in a database. Uh, another big data source uh, is that data generated from other SaaS tools. So we have a help desk, you know, we use Stripe to collect um, payments. And so, but you know, both of those are really relevant to the customer experience as well. You know, what, uh, you know, has a customer paid or not paid? Have they upgraded? Have they downgraded? You know, are they writing in for support? You know, are they confused? What are those support tickets tagged with? all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then something I didn't put on here as well, but I guess the third grouping would be our actual marketing site before someone signs up. You know, we do a lot of event tracking and page retracking on that. And we save that in our data warehouse as well. So that end-to-end that -end -to -end pirate metrics funnel Scott was talking about, one of the goals of our analytics stack was we wanted to be able to you know, have, have a view of that funnel across the entire journey. And that meant somehow being able to query and build charts or dig into analytics across each of those three data stores. So this is what we essentially came up with. You know, we've got the data warehouse down the bottom and that stores all the page view data from the marketing site, as well as all of our SaaS generated data. So Stripe, Help Scout, Zero, et cetera. And then our own product database is obviously storing uh, activity that happens within our actual web app. 
Uh, and we set up a third database. It's kind of an access layer to these two. And so it uses a feature called DB link, which is a PostgreSQL feature. But in essence, you can think about this third database as allowing us to query the data across the other two databases and join it together and get more complex. That's really the role that it's trying to fill. Uh, and then uh, within that database, we have a tool called DBT, which stands for Data Build Tool. And the website's getdbt.com. Uh, you may or may not have heard of this. It's, it's been something that we've really valued. It's in essence a, a tool that you can run to generate, you know, to turn all of your raw, ugly data warehouse tables into nice, clean, queryable tables for analytics. So it's the layer in which you do all the joins and the transformations and just cleaning everything up. And then the output is this you know, nice set of tables that hopefully more and more business users or you know, data scientists or product analysts or data engineers or whoever can all query the same tables and they're nice and clean. So you're not duplicating the SQL work you're doing. So that's been a critical part of the stack. And then uh, we do most of our analytics in mode analytics over there on the right hand side. Um, and that, you know, that allows us to, you know, to get really granular and to really look across the full, the full funnel. Uh, and so, you know, a few things I've already touched on there, but hey, yeah, just, yeah, hey, just on, on this one, uh, we were talking earlier and you evolved from, you used to use like mixed panel and some of your more, I guess, stock standard point and click ones. And you, you, I guess you were using them and then you found you needed to make that leap of almost your own kind of homegrown or more raw, um, more raw analytics stack. And it's, it's really interesting. It'd be great if you could share with everyone what drove that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the main, the main thing, I mean, that ties in with these points anyway, but definitely one of the things uh, was just the ability to access all of this data, you know, at, at, the, at, the, very, at, the, at the very first point. I, you know, I think the tools have come a long way. So these days, Amplitude and Heap Analytics, and then even Segments come a long way now because you can funnel all of this data through Segment. And I think they could actually send it over to Mixed Panel and Amplitude. So we've probably been doing this for three years or so now and uh, in, in different variations. But at the time, it was just really hard for us to get this multi, you know, multi-headed data sources into one place we could query. And you know, we found it really easy with Mixed Panel or Amplitude or whatever to query the marketing site data to query the events generated by the web app. But then it was hard to cross-reference that with Stripe data and whatnot. Uh, so that was the first driver. And then the second one, I think, was just, just accuracy. You know, one of the benefits of doing it this way is you know, we're relying on the product database directly. You know, that data warehouse, like that's the gospel data store. Uh, you know, we use a tool called Stitch to do the ETL from Stripe and from Zero and whatnot. And so we have 100% faith that that record's correct. Uh, and, and yeah, so we end up with a high level of efficacy um, in our reports and, and, and we're just confident they're 100% complete, they're 100% accurate. And that, that's really important. You know, we definitely found relying solely on the JavaScript tracking can be, a, can be a bit janky at times or data can go missing or whatnot. Yeah. And I guess this is removing the number, yeah, yeah, lowering the number of moving parts in a way. Would to, you, to um, it's interesting because you guys have like been through the journey to get there. Would you take a different path or do you still think, you know, you got to get to the point where you're hitting the limitations. Oh, do you yep. do you need to hit the limitations of mixed panel before you ditch it? Kind of thing is my my question, or amplitude or heap or yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I you know I definitely think there's a, like there's a, the the thing you lose with this is you know to do to do any charting at Vero now, you have to know some SQL and DBT's helped a lot, but that that's the roadblock. Um, and, uh, and those other tools make it far easier to, to build out a funnel chart and, and those sorts yeah. of things. So yeah, I definitely think there is, there's merit even in some having trade-offs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 you're making some trade-offs, yeah. yeah. So I think um, yeah, it probably depends where you're at. Uh, I, you know, I definitely think it's feasible to do this from the word go. And as you were saying earlier, just focus on one piece of the pie at a time. You know, for example, if, you, yeah, if your first goal was to focus on marketing site conversions, not that, not that that's a super product analytic, analytic example, but you, yeah. you know, you could get away with just whacking heap on there and, and getting a long way to increasing conversions, you know, before starting to worry about doing joins and mergers and things. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it might also depend on where the where you're at in the life is. cycle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now I'll let you keep going. No, that's good. Uh, I mean, I think I've kind of, you know, um, talked about the three advantages, but the first two anyway, but 100% accuracy and then being able to merge that product marketing and SaaS data. They're the two two of the big advantages from, um, from this model. And then 
yeah, by structuring it this way and having DBT working on that third database, that's been a big win as well. Uh, and that, and that, I guess that's a byproduct of being uh, doing it this way. Everything is SQL driven, uh, so people do have to learn SQL. Uh, but by using DBT, you know, we're, we're we're all using the same tool to write SQL queries. We're all deploying those SQL queries in the same way. Uh, so the naming structure is clearer. You know, if, if, and, and what I'm, an example of this might be, I don't know, I might want to create a SQL statement that, that uh, pulls out all the VIP customers. Maybe it's people that pay more than $500 a month. You know, with DBT, I can write that and can check it into GitHub. And I know that that will then be there for someone else to access. So if they want to yeah. query that, they don't have to rewrite it again. And that, that's been a big advantage of doing it this way with this third access layer database, because before that we had bits of SQL, you know, in, 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 on someone's hard drive, bits of SQL in mode, you know, who knows? Yeah, where. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so that was really annoying. Well, and your, your data warehouse and your product database is often a bit um, ugly, let's say. <laughs> oh, absolutely. 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 How do I query these things? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, like I was a software engineer and I even sit there sometimes like, oh no, you know, this is a couple of, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, transforming the names of things to be more readable and little things like that that, you know, maybe don't matter as much when you're developing. Um, to matter from, a, from an analytics readability point of view. So they're the three of the wins of doing it that way. And then the other two things I was going to talk about really were just the sorts of analytics we tend to do. You know, I definitely don't think we're, uh, you know, the, the benchmark in every way. And I think there's things we're still learning to do that you spoke about, Scott. You know, mostly what we do at the moment are two things. You know, one, we, we sort of have these health check metrics, which I guess are more our business as usual metrics. And uh, you know, there's two examples here. You know, workflows is one particular feature and um, you know we, we sort of want to make sure that's steady or growing over time you know obviously monthly active users monthly active companies we want to make sure that 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 number is going up as well uh, and i guess these are the things where we're, we're really looking for anomalies you can see on the workflows there it drops off massively but that was christmas so no one's at work it makes sense uh, but that's obviously something you want to look into um and so we definitely try and you know once something in our product is at that business as usual level uh, and the usage you know, we know it. We know it's being used. We know it's valuable to our customers. That's when we sort of start to add this to our product growth or our product analytics dashboard, uh, and we're looking at that on a monthly basis. Or sort of to your point, when I was asking you before, if we're working on one of these things, we'll we'll dive back in and look at it, you know, as part of the sprints on a weekly basis as well. Um, and so that's definitely a big class of, of product analytics for us, and, and trying to and trying to have you know at least one key metric per per key job to be done or per key feature supporting a job to be done. And who, who drives those conversations for you guys? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, myself, in our team, myself and then Rory, who's our head of design, uh, we, we're essentially the head of product together. And so it's the two of us that, that drive a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, obviously, when we're, when we're doing our product planning for the quarter, you know, we're discussing it as a whole team and referring back to this data as well as the um, qualitative data we're getting. And then, as you were saying, you know, if we're working on a project, diving this in more detail to make sure we really understand the usage pattern. And as you were talking about, defining what success would look like. Well, okay, well, if this is kind of the norm for this functionality, what sort of uplift are we looking for by improving it? That sort of stuff uh, is, is what we're striving to do. Um, so yeah, you know, just putting there some of the stuff we, we tend to look at. You know, I will say that we, we, you know, part of setting up these health check metrics is particularly in the early days of a feature, once it is released, you know, like this workflow is one on the left. You can left on the right. Sorry, you can see uh, you can see down the bottom that you know it was flat, right? So this is actually something we we did as part of the the beta launch. You can see the orange orange line goes up before the blue one. The blue one being workflows that are live. Um, and so and so this is also you know used as a way to start to see well what what is the uptake on this particular feature in general? And we will dive into that more if it's you know, either way more or way less than we were expecting. So again, that comes back to defining those success value metrics. And we might then run separate ad hoc reports. You know, these are examples of things that are locked in stone and we run on a, on a daily basis, but we, we might then just do ad hoc SQL reporting on it. Okay, well, like, who's using this feature you know, heaps? Uh, who's driving that massive usage? Is it widespread? Is it you know, for particular customers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we, we will use this as a kind of a guide to go deeper on that stuff and it, it um how often would you say something 
kind of randomly comes up in the analytics that then affects what you do next week? Yeah, I would say I would say not too often. Yeah, we're still a pretty small team. It's the it's the honest test of that. But whether or not that's yeah. a good thing, um, you know, I think uh, so. We have to we have to find we we tend to, yeah we tend to plan products on a quarterly basis, and so and so in that product planning, I like to think we're pretty thorough at looking at all the data inputs. So we'd have to see something pretty anomalous, you know, one way or the other, in between those cycles to really deviate from the things that we spend a lot of time prioritizing. So. Mm-hmm. Perhaps a little byproduct of how how we do things, but we um yeah you know for better or worse we we don't yeah 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 don't see too many of those anomalies yeah cool and then the last thing you know this is kind of where we're heading or what we're starting to do more of uh, or do a better job of I suppose you know I think a lot of the product decisions we've made in the past um I think some of the questions in the Q and A we can kind of touch back on this but yeah I mean we 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 definitely uh, use a lot of qualitative data um to to listen to our you know we talk to our customers we've got a public feedback board where they can you know leave suggestions we ask them questions you know we use product board to map all of that stuff you know we tag help tickets we deep dive into our help tickets and i would say all that stuff's qualitative and and i think in the past a lot of a lot of our decisions around what we build next or what we refine has been based on that but over the last couple of years you know we've been trying to get better and better at instilling you know rather than just doing the analytics which i think we've done a good job of for a while after the fact and you know looking at that uptake and the bau and whatnot uh actually as part of the design process when we're scoping out um what we're going to build and then and then and then what would actually be successful or what would success look like really really diving in and getting a better sense for how the products used today you know i don't think we've done a good job of that historically and so you know charts like this are an example and sort of talk some of the stuff you spoke about, Scott. You know, in this case, we're looking at the, you know, a very simple cohort analysis of people who didn't cancel their account versus people who churned. You know, is there some unifying pattern as to how much usage of our product there was? In this case, you'd want to run this a bunch of times. So it's not something you'd look at every day. It's something you do ad hoc, I think. And in our case, it was looking at the different key features we have and um, you know, what level of engagement with our workflows feature feature which is the flagship feature do customers have who churn versus don't churn and you can obviously see that interestingly you know in the first three months if they if they cross you know x threshold then they're far more likely to stay and so this is kind of just the start you then want to ask questions of okay well is this the same across all size of customers you know uh, smb is different from our mid-market customers you know maybe there's something there this this might not be causation is that right or correlation it might be might have nothing to do with it this might just be a symptom of whatever the core activation problem is uh, but it's certainly interesting to look at and so starting to use this data as well as that qualitative data to make decisions about what we build next because it will reveal where the biggest opportunity is uh, to help our customers better and, and to help us grow as a byproduct of that so that's and what. uh how is how's like has any data misled you on that causation and effect you know have you looked at something and off in a off on a tangent because we're like, oh, the data says it's going to succeed. Yeah, I don't. I think I think doing it this way so far, um, not so much. But we definitely, you know, um, you know, a- aggregating the qualitative data in the past and just relying on those, like that product, uh, public feedback board. You know, you've got upvotes there, so it is quantitative to a degree. Like you can clearly see, yeah. people are talking about this use case or this feature a hundred times more than this one, but. We've, we've definitely followed out, you know, followed those numbers and then in, you know, afterwards reflected that the uptake was nowhere near what it should have been based on that. And it comes back to, I think, not really understanding the problem the customer has, the use case, doing your yeah. own research. I think people, yeah, it's, it's just very natural as a human, you might forget the actual journey you went on using a product. So describing what you want or describing what your journey was when you interview a customer, they might forget key stuff, but the data doesn't lie if you go and look at the account or the user. Yeah, users. yeah, 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 yeah. You, um, you want to do both of those. Yeah. That's, it's a re- look, it remind my favorite example. Like, the thing that always comes to mind with this one is um, like Apple versus Nokia, where Nokia went and surveyed everyone around what they want, and they all said they wanted a bigger, sorry, smaller phone. And um, what was it? Yeah, Small right. phone and no keyboard or something. And then right. Uh, you know, Apple, sorry, smaller and flip phones and that kind of thing. And Apple's yep. gone and released a huge brick of a phone 
that was, you know, had a keyboard on it and everything. And it was like the complete opposite of what everyone's asking for. So the, the behavioral data showed something completely different to the, the feedback board, so to speak. Yeah, that's it. That is a great story. Um, so I, hopefully we'll make less and less of those, you know, mis, mishaps or misdirections in the future. With the day, yeah. No, awesome. Um, I'm going to jump. It, it, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. I'm just going to, hopefully everyone can see my screen again. Um, question time. We've got one in Q&A. Now's the time if you've got questions for Chris or I to um, pump it into the Q&A or the chat channel um, and we'll try and get through them. So there's a couple already that I said we'd come back to. The first one in the Q&A is would metrics help the justification for a need to revamp the UI or streamline a process of an enterprise product? I think um, the the answer is yes, definitely. Like if you can see that um, you've got metric or analytics that show that people are dropping off or that the engagement rate is low or you know a particular step in the UI is not working, then you can like, you've got data. If you've got analytics in there, you've got data to show what's not working. I think what you might struggle a bit with is um, uh you you might try to justify the what's missing so if you're you know if your your enterprise product is showing that you know you're getting 100 people start using a feature and then only 50 uh, are getting through to the next step um someone might say oh well that's just normal to have a drop off at this stage but um you you might need to show a comparison and say well you know in this product that's not the case or you might want to show the time taken between steps and say, you know, people stay five minutes to do this task isn't acceptable. You, you might have to get a bit creative with how you justify it, but a analytics is going to give you data one way or another. Um, I, I'd say the, the answer is absolutely analytics can help. My, um, I was going to add to that, Scott. And I think that one reminded me of a book I was reading, but yeah, I can definitely see how it was interesting. You mentioned enterprise product, but um, yeah, so someone could argue and say, well, you know, our customers don't care about that. Like, you, you know, maybe our sales process is locking them in or, uh, you know, we, we, we don't think that's our competitive advantage. It's about the data set we provide. No one gives a shit about the UI or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. French. It would be easy to make those cases. I think product metrics is, um, you know, the, the, as Scott was saying, I think the, the hard part is you've got to convince people to give it a go and the metrics will help in that. Or having the metrics driven development life cycle it would more be about saying like okay i could be wrong here i think that the ui is weighing us down like we're going to convert more people in this step in order to tell if i'm right we need to have product metrics would you all agree no one can argue that that's a fact and then of course you might test it and it may actually be that the customers of the enterprise product don't care about the ui i'd say that's unlikely but um but ha you know having the metrics there and being willing to fail you know will will, will come out of those success failure things so um, yeah, I guess yeah, awesome. it might not help convince you to get that first. Can we have a crack at this? But uh, I think it would be hard for anyone to argue that installing at least some metrics is, um, is a good idea. Yeah. Cause it's, it's almost like if you're saying, should we get more data to understand the problem for someone to say no, that no, <laughs> no, to yeah, that exactly. is a exactly. bit of a big leap. No, no, we don't want data here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Um, all right. So the next one is. Uh, I assume larger companies like Google instrument all their features, which can then be viewed by feature teams. And the, there's a quick answer, which is, which is yes. But then there's a longer answer, answer, which is I've learned don't assume much about large companies and how, how sophisticated they might be in what they're doing. Sometimes there might be um, challenges that they have by virtue of their, by, by reason of their size, that might prevent them from having the data that you might think they have. So I think Google's probably out there with, um, you know, data is a huge part of their, their like values. Um, but all large companies have got pockets of, of problems or challenges where it, for whatever reason, and a lot of good reasons often, where they just can't instrument everything. Um, ho hopefully that helps answer that. Um, 
does product analytics tie in with AB testing? Chris, I'm going to let you answer that one because I feel like it's a really, really good fit with, with your world. So the question is, yeah, does, does product analytics tie in with AB testing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would say definitely. And the way I think about it would be, you know, you've got, you've got your, you know, if you, if you, so you have to think about what you want to instrument and what you want to track to understand you know, the usage of a particular feature or a particular set of features. And then I think AB testing is, is then a tool to, you know, with statistical significance, confirm whether A or you know, B is better than A, C is better than A, whatever. So you need the product metrics in place to determine you know, well, what, what is the conversion or the usage pattern of each of these different things. And A-B testing, the way I see it, is about running multiple of those at the same time um, through a, with a big enough sample size that you can then look at the product metrics out the other side and with confidence say, yeah, B is 20% better than A and we've like, rigorously tested it tested that because we pushed a whole statistically relevant sample through this particular funnel. So yeah, I think they, they tie in perfectly with each other. Just to add to uh, Chris's answer would be, uh, um, I've also done poor man's AB testing <laughs> with statistic statistical finger in the air, like, totally. oh, that looks all right. <laughs> totally. I'll do. Well, just because we didn't want to implement an AB testing tool, we would just do like, all right, this week, we're going to switch this this version of the feature on and we're going to track how people go this week. And then next week we're going to switch. We're just going to, we've got two ideas. We're going to switch this other one on next week. So like we tried to make it as, as um, a control of a trial as we could where as much things were similar, but I think it was the poor man's AB testing. So we literally did two versions of the feature and, and looked at, it was really two versions of a funnel and we just it brought no opinion to it and just said, we're going to do both. Which one, does the data say is better? And we didn't have statistical, um, we, the stage of the product meant we couldn't, we, but we're, we're like some information, we need something here because we're not sure something's better than nothing. So we, we gave, I call it the poor man's AB test for, for when you don't have much volume. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's fine. Also, I think the, the bigger the change, like the quicker the test would come good anyway. So it's almost the same. You know, if, if the change is yeah, really dramatic, yeah, yeah. A B test or not, you can it's usually done. Tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's a few more here. Uh, please keep popping questions in. We've got another another five minutes. There's one around um velocity and measuring measurement of velocity and where does that factor in? I think it's a bit of a timeline of how long a person first shows interest to conversion. Uh, you know, measuring velocity. I think it's a really, really good point to to remember with analytics. So measuring the, the rate of change, uh, like how quickly someone is moving across say the pirate metrics funnel or a different funnel if you're using it to see how quickly they're moving across that. And the more instrumented your product is, the better you can see that from acquisition through to referral or, or retention. And so you can see perhaps if someone's joining via a particular channel, you know, maybe they're referred by a particular partner then they tend to have better retention than someone that was referred by a, um, like came off social media or Twitter or a webinar or something. So just, um, yeah, that's it. Like the, the change in that is a great one and whether you're able to bring it down or not over time is important as well. That's a really good point to, to add. Thanks for that, um, Sam, for adding that. And then um, last one is, which I think got covered from Anik, which is, uh, what skills and experiences require are required to be part of product the products and anal analytics space? Um, I think you, you heard from Chris like their non-technical folks have learned how to use SQL it seems in order to be able to um, Understand what's going on in their products. So I think SQL is a good skill to have um, Being able to understand a database Being able to understand data. So uh, you know, brushing up on your statistics is a really good one I've found. So, and then other, like just other things around reading data is important. Like what kind of, you know, what, what is the difference between causation and correlation? What's the difference um, between uh, mean and median? All starts to become pretty important when you're reading, reading data. Um, so yes, yeah, stats, SQL, um, you don't necessarily have to have programming skills. And then 
familiarization with some of the tools is useful, but there, to be honest, a lot of them are quite easy and straightforward to use. So not a big, not a huge, um, not a huge deal. Hopefully that helps. Uh, so are there any, before we drop off, are there any other questions anyone's got? Nope. All righty. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time and sharing a bit of a, um, I feel pretty lucky to get to see under the covers a bit around what you're doing because it's not every day you get to see what people are doing behind their products, especially one with, with as many, like handling as many emails and, and customers as you guys are. That's, it's just such a valuable insight for, for people to see. So thanks again for that. Thanks no for coming on. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for joining us. Hope you all stay safe, stay well, and um, see you on the next one. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>